listeners, I'm going to start with some words of reflection from the gospel according to Matthew. I will read verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the, in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the shaft he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Friends, our guest today is the Reverend Dr. Rachel Lawrence. Rachel serves as the acting pastor of the Second Baptist Church, which is in Suffield, Connecticut. In addition to her pastoral ministry, Rachel also serves as assistant director for the Center for Education Policy at UMass Amherst. Rachel is also a wife and mother of two, recently tossed into homeschooling on top of bivocational ministry. She's a frequent contributing author for Christian Citizen. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Jamie. I'm looking forward to our conversation as um, you really selected one of my favorite difficult passages of scripture <laughs> for discussion today. And I, it's an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much. And I'm glad that you said that this is one of your favorite difficult passages. As I've been reading some of these passages that we'll be discussing and preaching about during the season of Lent, that's something that I've really noticed, that we know bits and parts of these scriptures and they bring us so much comfort. But then as we keep reading, things become a little bit more challenging. It's not the peaceful baby Jesus that we met a few months ago during the season of Advent. This is a Jesus who's kind of, you know, ready to ready to go into something new. <laughs> for lack of a better word. To so, make some radical change, whether that is personal, societal, global, this is not easy stuff. Definitely. <laughs> stuff to hear, especially in the context of our culture some days. So, so what, are, what are your reactions when you hear this passage? Well, one of the first reactions I have is... Um, and, and this comes from my, I have a background as a classical musician and music teacher. So when I hear make straight in the highway, uh, a highway for our God, I think of the opening of the Messiah. And it strikes me that when, because we have heard this passage so much, we hear it every year in the Lenten season, we hear something similar come up this time of year in the lectionary, we hear it in the Messiah. This is one of those scriptures that is so familiar, we risk losing meaning from it. It just becomes one of the things you say, almost it, it could be held as a platitude. Um, I think about the metaphor of the highway and how it was end of the path and how these metaphors were selected intentionally by the writers of our gospels to reflect Isaiah's prophecy and to basically illustrate your journey with God. So it's, it's a really common metaphor. And I, you know, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it's an intentional metaphor. 
That being said, making a straight road in the wilderness seems like it should be an easy prospect. In today's society, you'd measure, you would have, uh, you'd hire, what's that, a surveying crew. They would get you the exact right spots. There'd be a geological study and they would plow through, make the flat plate, like the, the high places flat, <laughs> et cetera, get the trees out of the way, get the stumps out of there and, and pave. And you could potentially have a straight road very, very quickly. That being said, it's not like you just build a road and it's good. It requires constant work. If you've ever driven through the state of Pennsylvania, you know it requires constant work. <laughs> um, you know, we have frost heaves, we have weather that washes things away, we have challenges that buffet that straight road at each and every turn to the point where you're not just making a straight road once, making a straight road is a constant endeavor. And so, you know, I think we have to think carefully when we accept the call to Christianity to accept that it isn't just a one and done. It isn't just your baptism, you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your savior and you're done. You still have to keep maintaining that road. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and that practice of maintenance, as you've said, is is really the difficult part. I think that's one of the most difficult parts of the human experience, how we can maintain our our growth. And, you know, as as you've stated, you've created this really great image for us, even here in our own country, these wilderness roads that we drive on and how much maintenance they require, even city roads. <laughs> Right. how much maintenance it requires that's such a powerful image that you've painted in our minds you've brought it right to where we are yeah when i you know I, I think about it in our own country we have such great roads we take them for granted the same way we could be prone to taking this piece of scripture for granted we've got to remember that people put their life's work into maintaining these things <laughs> And similarly, our life's work as Christians is maintaining that relationship, maintaining the walk. Um, so yeah, I, so I, every once in a while, there's a meme, it, at least five, 10 years ago, there was a meme comparing the Apian way, the famous Roman highway that still stands to modern roads. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of the scripture, the, the, the highway. Um, even building the Apian way, it's not exactly straight. It's not exactly level. It's not exactly even. You can't take a modern car over those cobblestones and have it work. <laughs> In order to bring that up to the straight highway, it would need some work. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, anyway. Definitely. And so so one thing that we think about a lot during the season of Lent is the experience of being in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So what does that experience mean for us now? You know, we aren't literally living in deserts and wilderness. Most of us, some of our listeners might be living in de deserts and wilderness, but what does that image mean for us as Christians? I've heard you, be I've heard you speaking about the maintenance we have to do as Christians. Like, yeah. what is that work that we must do? The wilderness is so in like, to me, it's one of the most fascinating places to be spiritually in Lent is to acknowledge that we don't, we don't have the answers. Things aren't always easy. The world tries to close in around us with the pressures of the world. Um, but I think we understand wilderness in a whole new way coming into this Lent than we did going into last Lent. Um, when last Lent started, we were still meeting in person. I had done my first um, Ash Wednesday in a new congregation. This new congregation, Baptist, really enjoys the imposition of ashes. I'd had an in-person meeting where, with 20, 30 people where we had gone through that sacred ceremony and, and remembered that we are dust, right? <laughs> and to dust we shall return. It was beautiful. 
it was intimate, it was close. We were in a very small room. Um, one of my deacons did it for me after the whole service. And I just remember all of the contact, the hugging, the warmth. We entered the wilderness last year from this place of luxury and privilege. <laughs> um, and we entered quickly into a wilderness of isolation before we really understood how the virus was transmitted and we retreated to our houses and we retreated to staying indoors and maybe sending one person out shopping <laughs> for the whole family. Um, we found ourselves in a wilderness of contact. Um, we humans, we're social animals. Even the most introverted and grouchy of us needs friends, family, contacts, hugs, <laughs> etc. And so we have now wandered for nine months in that wilderness. And the wilderness has had changing rules around us, but it's still been that wilderness. Um, as we come into this Lent, it's like, I feel in some ways we're still living out last Lent. <laughs> and it, it hasn't been a bad place to be, to be honest. The wilderness is like, for those of us who love to go hiking, I'm one of them, <laughs> it's, you know that when you're in the wilderness, you can feel connected to humanity and the earth through being in the trees and through seeing the creatures and, and, and being at one with creation, but that you can't stay there forever, right? <laughs> Two, as much as you might want to stay there forever, that like, so part of the beauty of the experience is coming in and going out. Um, so, as we're entering this new season of wilderness this year, I'm hoping that there's an end in sight, at least of, of this particular wilderness, so that we can get back to exploring those other wildernesses, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is so true. And, but the strange part is that I feel like this experience of being in this shared wilderness together has also made us acutely aware of the other wildernesses in which we are wandering collectively. So I thought what was so interesting after I read this scripture as you were talking about, it operates on a personal level of telling us what we must do at perhaps at a level of a Christian church level of telling us what we must do, but it's also pointing to a change that must happen at the societal level if we wish to move forward together. Um, so yeah, that's the other thing that comes to mind for me. You know, uh, one thing that people say we're living in multiple pandemics right now. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's really, it's highlighted to me just how interconnected and how much we need each other. And if we are going to get out of this wilderness, it's going to be because of our collective action. Definitely. We're not, wandering solo in the wilderness, um, no matter how disconnected we might feel through these screen interactions or um, the uh, like watching a video service, that sort of thing. It, um, it also occurs to me that while I've been stuck in the wilderness, I've had the great privilege of being isolated with my family. Mm -hmm. we, this wilderness has been an opportunity to explore some deeper connections as a family, to really get the, to understand each other better, to understand like, how do we live in this closed space and really honor each other's needs? Um, my oldest child is an extrovert, <laughs> a very extroverted, somewhat autistic child um, <laughs> who loves to shout trivia at you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> just loves, 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 loves to do this. And he, he needs the reinforcement of people being like, TJ, tell us about something you know. And then my youngest is sweet, generous, nurturing, all those things, and very introverted. She is the type of child that will lock herself in a room to play for a little bit. And if you come in, she'll be like, mom, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> She wants her space. So in this wilderness, we've had the ability to, to learn more about each other and to navigate those issues. 
And um, I wouldn't have had this time with them before the pandemic. Right. I would have been splitting my time between driving to one workplace at UMass Amherst and another play, workplace at the church. And now somehow we found a lifestyle in which it all works. They get that parental attention and I get to know more about them than I would have without the pandemic. So, so first of all, I'll say I, I relate to your daughter. I am that exact <laughs> same way as an adult. Um, why did you open that door? I'm in here. <laughs> it's definitely my reaction. And as you've said, I think whoever we're quarantining with, you know, me as a newlywed, we're learning so much about each other and our styles. And my husband is extraordinarily introverted, but doesn't mind sitting in public space, just not talking to anyone. I don't want to be looked at if I'm having introvert time. So yeah. I can really relate to what you're saying about the ways that we've learned each other. Yeah. It's incredible because even the wilderness is generative space. And as you've said, I'm thinking even about the poem of Amanda Gorman at the oh. inauguration. And one of the powerful things that she was saying throughout her poem is the only way that we get to the next stage is to do it together. And I think of a similar African proverb, we go, you know, we might go quickly if we go along, but we we will get there together, essentially. Yes. So I think that's such a profound message for us during this time that we have to figure out a way to get to the next step together. Yes, 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 yes. I was just thinking about how, how the context of life in Afri in, in any of the Af many of the African countries where you could be walking by yourself and in extreme peril without knowing it <laughs> from animals, from, you know, nature. Um, I mean, really that could happen anywhere, but it, it almost seems more, more extreme when set on the continent. Um, but if you have somebody with you, you're so you have safety in the numbers. You will get there. There's there's more of a guarantee of getting <laughs> getting to your destination. Yeah, definitely. And it feels like this wilderness theme. You know, we know that we know that uh, here the gospel writer is quoting the prophet Isaiah, and we know that this theme of wilderness recurs throughout the Hebrew Bible. The children of Israel wander around in the wilderness and they get to where they're going because they ultimately have to stay together, I think is one of the things that's coming out here. Um, and then we see that theme of wilderness again, even when we get to the gospels, you know, we're, we're never quite out of the wilderness, it seems. Right. It's, it's like cyclical wilderness. <laughs> sort of like the liturgical year. I hadn't thought about that. We cycle in and out purposefully because our walk with the wilderness is one of the constants of life. Yeah. Wow. That's an insight. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, it's incredible the way that the time just keeps folding in on itself. And yet, if we keep God at the forefront of it, there's still a way that we make it through even these wilderness experiences. So yeah, that's, that's powerful. Indeed. Good food for the journey. <laughs> so I have one last question for you as we wrap up today. During these times of wilderness that we've been talking about throughout our conversation today, um, this wilderness that we're living in right now, how and where are you experiencing the steadfast love of God? Initially, I was feeling the steadfast love of God through spending time outdoors, through um, looking up at the sky. And if you remember early on in the pandemic, when we cut down our driving quite a bit, the, the color of the sky changed. It was blue, very blue absolutely clear in the Northeast until the fires, um, <laughs> because we wound up getting dust and smoke from the California fires. Um, and it just, it was so striking of, you know, you, you're doing something difficult right now, but here's God's beauty. 
for you to live in and enjoy and you are safe where you are. Now, God's steadfast love really comes to me through the, like, the continuity of online worship through all these media that we have where we, you know, we can have conversations like this, that honestly, we wouldn't have thought about having before the pandemic, right? We can reconceptualize our concept of the church so that the church is not just my local church and their preferred missions. It's all of these folks who might tune in on Sunday morning or, and find meaning that day with us but might be tuning in somewhere else on another Sunday. Um, it's, if you want now, you can go to church almost any time of day, anywhere in the United States on YouTube, right? You can even pick any liturgical season you want. We've, we've done the cycle now. Um, and like, what a blessing that is. And it's like, it's representative of God's love for us. Like the world might have tried to shut down our connection to God's love by cutting us off from each other. But through it, just look how much it has broken through and spread in these new and creative ways. Like my, my kids sometimes ask me if there is evidence for God. And I'm like, look at all of this. Look at what we human beings have been able to do because we were empowered by God to keep going as a church in these times. Well, amen. I love what you said about the church, but I want to go back quickly to what you said about nature. And it reminds me also of something that happened to me at the beginning of the pandemic. So back in March, and I used to live on the west side of Los Angeles. So right over kind of near like Sunset Boulevard and, you know, these kind of famous streets in LA. Yeah. And so I liked to go for runs in the morning. And, you know, you kind of have to go a little bit early because the, like you said, the cars start moving at 7 a.m. People are zipping all over the place trying to get to work and play and wherever they're going. And so one day I was running up Sunset. It's a really big hill. Um, I was getting in good shape, but it's a really big hill. <laughs> and so usually I feel tormented running up that hill and there are so many cars coming. But that day there were not cars out. It was pretty quiet. So I just felt like I could privately suffer while I ran up my hill. <laughs> and all of a sudden I see this animal running down the middle of the street. And I thought, oh my goodness, someone accidentally left their dog out and the dog is running. <laughs> and I got closer and Rachel, it was a deer that had come out from the woods and suddenly felt free and comfortable because there were not cars and construction all over its homeland. It was able to run freely down the middle of Sunset Boulevard at eight in the morning. Beautiful. And in that moment, it was a reminder to me, even in this moment of being so isolated and not being able to do the normal things in this moment, creation is singing. Creation is having a moment. All of God's creatures are having this freedom moment. And, and it's, you know, uh, we, we can't get away from all the death and the devastation and the pain of this time. And yet there is life. And I think that's one of the ways that I'm experiencing God's love during this time, the and yet of yeah. it all. Yeah. And God is the God of the living and the dead. And God loves the people who have died of COVID and continues to love them <laughs> on the other side. And it just, there's so much comfort in that. I'm, I love picturing the deer running in the middle of Los Angeles. I've, I've only been to the West Coast a couple of times and ironically both times it rained um, <laughs> but i've never seen traffic like like there and so to to to, to have this vision uh, of los angeles empty and and being able to run with a deer that morning how beautiful <laughs> So you all, this has been a conversation with Reverend Dr. Rachel Lawrence. So thankful to have you here. Grateful for this conversation. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again for having me. Good to see you, Jamie.